Welcome to our interview series, We Choose to Thrive, brought to you by Becky Norwood of The Woman I Love. We bring you stories of survivors who have chosen to heal, to thrive. If you are an abuse survivor and are starting or continuing your healing journey, these stories will provide hope, inspiration, and a knowingness that you are not alone. Join us in today's interview. So could you tell me a little bit about when your abuse started and, and how? I know you mentioned that it was at the hands of your stepfather. Yeah, started um, at age five. How long did it last for you? Well, it's about 15. It's a long time. Yeah. And bottom line, what would you say that it did to you as far as your self-esteem? It made me nervous around other men. That was number one. Any any man at all. I mean, it could be my uncle, it could be my cousin. It devalued me in, with them. I think I became more of a, I thought it was normal, I became flirty around them, if that sounds right. Mm-hmm. Like I wanted them to like me, and if they didn't, I really tried my hardest to make them like me. And then there were times when I just didn't like them. I just didn't like men at all. Like when I started getting 12, I didn't like men at all. My best friends were, you know, my aunt and things like that. My teachers, I was, I delve into school a lot. But then when I became maybe 13 or 14, I needed to get their attention. How did it affect you as you grew, grew into, came into adulthood? Uh, I, number one, I didn't know anything about relationships. It damaged what I was supposed to know of any relationships, and it made me limit them. So it made me begin a list before I even got the friends. So if I had, were, was looking for a friend, I started the list already. I want this, I want that. And the minute that I saw something that resembled that, I wasn't friends. So I limited myself in friendships and relationships with other people. And the other thing is, I became a professional liar, not in intentionally, but because that, you know, I guess it was ingrained in me that to always be fit. And everything, everything was a lie. Everything. I would create things. But mine was more or less, I was more inclined to suicide. So I got into, um, I, I skipped right over alcohol, went right straight to really hard drugs. And then the day that I did go to hard drugs, I literally sat on the train tracks and tried to kill myself. Mm -hmm. With my son, what started, it took so many years. Right after that, I started going to church, and not that I didn't have God, I just thought it was a a peaceful place to be. And I started getting involved in church, but the worst thing was that they followed, and I was spiritually raped in the church, so I was put in the back burner yet again, last again. And my perpetrator became my authority figure yet again. So it was really hard in church. So what's been the most positive thing that you've done for yourself? Most positive thing is I found out that I don't have to be a survivor, but I can recover. Learning about forgiveness really because I thought I knew it on both sides of forgiveness for against the act, the act itself, but forgiving myself and saying that I even though I felt that way, you know, because I would say to myself, I felt ashamed uh, for feeling like I liked it when I didn't. So I had to forgive myself and say it was all right. I didn't know what I was feeling. And when I did that, I was able able to move, to move on, because I wasn't able to. So it was, I think, learning the new side of, or the side of forgiveness that I didn't even realize was affecting me. The forgiveness... We do for ourselves. Yeah. We have to forgive ourselves. And the forgiveness comes, um, even of others, it's more for ourselves. Yeah. Because they may never know. They may yep, absolutely. Or even care to know or even acknowledge their, the role that they play. But the, the, I knew that part, but what part I did that was stopping me and was stopping me in my progression to heal and to relate to others and to 
in my business and, and my finance part on everything I never forgave myself for certain things like I'll, I'll give you an example for financially he would give me money as a reward and I hated it I hated it so when he handed it to me I would wash it and I would iron it and then put it on the bed and never use it so that be just that act alone brought me to this time in my life now where finances what was bothering me because I, I can't hold money. I can't hold money, so I had to re figure out where that came from. You know, why am I like this? Why don't I really like to feel money? And I had to realize that and forgive myself and say it was all right. Money was not the the, the reason why that I, I'm like this, you know, that I can't feel money. It's not the not the money itself, it's the perpetrator paying me. And it was okay, you know. So I had to go through a lot of those, you know, the uh, sifting and the taking off the bad parts, I guess. Of it's like peeling an onion. Yeah, that's what I call it. That's exactly what I call it. Um, I had written my book three years before I released it. God had to take me through a journey within myself to know myself. I had completely forgot that I wrote it. It was, I mean, literally it was gone. I went online one day and... Um, cloud so it reminded me that I had some documents there so I went on and I was looking through them I was like what is this oh this and it was just totally shocking and I'm looking at it and I'm going so of course again the onion I'm peeling the onion I'm crying I'm going through the emotional thing with it and all I heard God say was it's time so of course I was worried about everybody not believing me everybody um, staying away from me, you know, and everybody not accepting me. But I did it. I published it, put a name on there, and I did it. And ever since then, I've been freer than a bird with, like, an eagle. I've been higher than that. I've been soaring, you know, and it's it's freeing to, to be able to get all of that out of you, mm -hmm. you know. So it's freeing. Yeah, I, I did it for like 15 years, real estate for 15 years. My, I raised my children. I have three of them. My youngest is 27. He'll be, and I said, you know, um, I had been coaching all along, like in the religious sector, because I was a, an assistant pastor, so I, over the youth. So I had been counseling all along with the community, children, anyone that came, I came in contact with. But I never thought it was something that, I was supposed to do, created to do. I never thought about that. It was just something, oh, well, I was more commanded. And not until I did full circle and came back and, um, you know, finding the book, publishing the book, speaking for a couple of agencies, did I, did I really look back and say, you know what, I, this is easy. And this is something that I know that I can relate and I can help other people with. Three, three clients now on a regular basis. It's something that I know that I, I want to do. I'd like to do it as a group, but does it really happen in a group? I don't know, you know. What words of wisdom could you offer to those that are just, they've experienced it, they're broken, they're, they're hurting. Could you give that would help another person say, I can do this. I can, I can heal. I can not just heal, but thrive. I would tell them everyone is not the same. And that your the way you heal is the way you heal. You're not alone, that's for number one. But for myself, I would kind of compare myself to other people in, you know, whatever, the group. And I'm saying, why am I not getting it like they are? Um, but, every, but you will get it because realization is, is key. It's okay to feel what you feel when you feel it. It's okay. Because you have to go through the emotion, you have to go through all of that, and it's okay to feel that way. Because I found when I was going through everything, everybody was like, it's going to be okay. No, don't worry about it. You know, like, get over it. And I'm like, no, it's okay for me to feel this way. I have a right to feel this way. I have, to, I have a right to be mad or, you know, angry, cry as long as I need to so that I can make it because those are things I have to go through. But I was the one that kind of stopped it from going to the other sisters. 
So it's the sacrifice. Many times that we are. Like all of my childhood, whenever, you know, when you're growing up, so at five, six, when you're supposed to be gaining all, you know, the fun times in your life, creativity, gone, you know. Yeah. At 10, you're supposed to be gaining, um, learning how to make relationships out in the new world, gone. I didn't have that. I couldn't do that. Mm-hmm. Not with, with not without not with that horrible secret laying there, you know, I couldn't do that. Fifteen, I'm supposed to be gaining some kind of confidence to get out into the world. Can't do that. It's all gone. So all the important things that, that gets me ready or gets someone ready to move on in life are all gone or stripped away. There is light at the end of the tunnel. There is joy that's had on the other side. Yes, there is. It's not permanent. It's not a permanent injury. It's Mm -hmm. something we will never forget. And it's something that will always go with us, but it doesn't have to control our world. No. What resources can you recommend? Miracle of of, uh, the train didn't come for a whole day. (laughs) Um, And my... suicide attempt I was I went on the bus the next day and I was still crying I was crying with total of three days and I got on the, the bus to go take my son somewhere to see a character and I was crying and a lady gave me this card and it was a psychiatrist and um, I went to see her and I think that was a turning point for me because I had a safe place to be and safe, someone safe that I could share everything with and it was I was able to do that and that kind of started my healing. I didn't know that I had to continue because there was so much damage. She was not the one that I, I you know, I, I stayed with her for a little while, then I went to someone else. But at stages in your life, you have to go and address them to be safe, you know. Even though we were saying the same things, for me it was, I went through a couple of people to find two, only two that I really loved of my lifetime. You have the right to, I would say, seeking a psychiatrist or someone who specializes in that. This story was brought to you by The Woman I Love at www.thewomanilove.com. If you are starting down the path to healing, no matter what stage, our united message is that you are not alone. We do not want to live with a victim mentality. We choose to thrive, and as such, we are joining hands to spread the message that you too can heal and thrive. Will you join us as a force of change we need in our world? Only by healing, growing strong, and uniting can we create the awareness of this terrible epidemic that is plaguing our world. We heal in many different ways. There is no one right way to heal. But the right thing to do is to heal. Heal for yourself, for your families, and for our world. Will you join us in this We Choose to Thrive revolution? Reach out to us at www.thewomanilove.com. Also check out the incredible resources at www.rainn.org. And if you are actively facing abuse in this moment, do not delay. Seek out help in your local community immediately. Here is to your wellness, healing, and thriving.